Okay, thank you very much, uh, Matthias, for this nice introduction. Thanks, uh, Sylvie. Thanks for all the people involved in this uh, event. I know it is not easy, and uh, and uh, it is it takes a lot of time. And I really want to thank you for for organizing this. This is really it's not a trivial matter. People take it for granted. Oh yeah, you put together things and then it works. That's not correct. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, all right, so I'm going to give three lectures about mathematical, uh, I don't know if this is the, the pointer does not work, okay. There's no pointer. Oh yeah, here it is. Yeah, but it is very tiny. Do you see it, the red thing? Maybe you don't, it doesn't matter. All right, so, uh, so I'm going to give lectures about mathematical analysis geophysical flows, and then I'm going to move and talk a little bit about data assimilations. However, since I am the first speaker and I'm going to talk about the mathematical analysis, so bear with me, I would like to basically even the ground before we put the foundation. So I'm going to talk about some classical standard stuff for some of you, but then slowly de go deeper and deeper into the situation. And the reason I want to do this introduction about the elementary stuff, at least to show you where are the obstacles in Navier-Stokes equations, where we are stuck in Navier-Stokes, and how when we moved into different circumstances because of different scales, geophysical models, such issues can be overcome and some of them can still be there. So that's why I need to put things in, in context. So let me start from <clears throat> an equation which is we take it for granted and this is the Buzinisk approximation for, uh, for, uh, uh, for fluid which is with buoyancy. So the first equation here is the conservation of momentum. U is the velocity, and uh, rho zero is like a constant background uh, density. So nu is the viscosity here, and uh, the unknowns are the three components of the velocity and the pressure, P, and the temperature, T. So this is the buoyancy because uh, imagine that you have a layer of fluid heated from the bottom and cooled from the top. How do I connect it with geophysics? For example, the atmosphere is heated from the bottom and cooled from the top. So people say heated from the bottom. What heats the atmosphere? I would say the ocean. It says, oh, if you are a Mediterranean, you go to California, you cannot even swim in the Pacific Ocean. It's too cold for you. What do you mean you heat the atmosphere? As we know, if you know everything I know, and I know everything you know, then there is nothing to have exchange. We have to have differences in order to have exchange. So you need differences, so you need gradient. And that's why what's important is the difference between the temperature of the ocean and up there in the, in the atmosphere, in the stratosphere, where there's a big difference. And that's why you start seeing that there is a gradient in the temperature and so on and so forth. So the, 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 the temperature is the buoyancy. I'm talking about incompressible fluid. And this is the equation of uh, heat uh, diffusion plus transport. So in this series of lectures, I am going to talk about them from the analysis point of view. I'm not talking about the modeling, where they're coming from. I will try to connect sometimes to give, put things in perspective. But the idea is mostly about the mathematical analysis. Now, if somebody gives me system of equation and you would like to check what happens with this system, do you have existence, uniqueness, do the solution become singular in finite time? What's happening in this case? Usually you start doing estimates and you see if you can really push these estimates forward and everything remains finite, then you are okay and then you try to go and clean it and make it rigorous. Now, as you know, in, because every, everyone in this crowd, I assume, knows that you know, the difference between ODEs and PDEs is that in ordinary differential equations, the space where the solution exist, the phase space is given in advance, like in Rn. So the vector is in Rn. But in PDEs, usually the space where the solution makes sense is part of the problem. I have to figure out in which space the equation makes sense. Is it in the space of continuous function, the space of solar space, is it the space of C17 analytic function? And now, because these are infinite dimension spaces, so showing that one norm is finite does not mean that the other norms are finite. 
And that's what makes it even more interesting. And that's why we talk about estimates, namely estimates in which norms, because the norms are not equivalent, and so on and so forth. So let me start doing formal estimates. And I look at this equation. I will put sometimes the hat of an engineer or like a, a very rough applied uh, mathematics in order to get uh, before really I clean things up. So if you look to this equation to the temperature, you see if there is a maximum point, the gradient is 0, so this term disappear. If there's a maximum point, the Laplacian is negative, so therefore this is all positive. You bring it to the right-hand side. The time derivative at the maximum is negative, so the maximum goes down. And the minimum is just the opposite, and therefore you are trapped, the temperature between the maximum and the minimum originally, plus maybe whatever happened contribution from the boundary. And as a result, one can show that the temperature remains bounded all the time. So, Namely, that it is in L infinity. This is what's called the maximum principle. So the temperature has no problem. And now the next question will become, what happens with the gradient of the temperature, not the amplitude of the temperature? Why? Because I would like to see, do I have a cold front or a hot front? Namely, cold front, namely, it is like now hot, and then suddenly it's going to be very cold. So therefore, the gradient is very, very sharp. So therefore, I need to understand the gradients. And because I would like to understand the gradients, and I would like to talk about weak solutions, or solutions in some sense not classical, so I need to introduce the concept of Sobolev spaces. So therefore, let me just give you, in the case of periodic boundary conditions, for those who do not know what Sobolev spaces, not the spaces, Sobolev spaces, this is the space of all functions which are periodic. So this is the, the, the Fourier expansion. And now you need the Fourier coefficients to decay fast enough to beat this algebraic growth when s is the index for the Sobolev space. So the larger the s, in order for the series to converge, the Fourier has to decay very fast, which means that the weight you give for high oscillations is smaller and smaller when s is larger, which means that the function should have less and less wrinkling and less and less oscillations, which means supposed to be smoother. And that's the idea behind even the Sobolev embedding theorem, that when s is large, the function is is even continuous, and then even C1, and so on and so forth. So I give it in the periodic boundary condition for simplicity, but at least to have a feeling for what we mean by Sobolev spaces. And S is, in some sense, the number of derivatives. So it means that you have S derivatives in the space L2, therefore the function in Sobolev, in Sobolev space. As I mentioned earlier, so this is the equation that I'm interested in. And I've just indicated to you how did I show that the Temperature is in L infinity is bounded all the time. So if there is some contribution from the boundary plus the initial temperature. So I am bounded all the way. And now I would like to understand what happens to the gradient of the temperature. So formally, what would I do? I multiply by minus Laplacian the equation of the temperature. Here is the equation of the temperature. I multiply by Laplacian and integrate by parts or, over the domain. Using boundary conditions, the appropriate boundary conditions, I will not worry about the boundary terms. Therefore, I get that the L2 norm of the gradient evolution, and this is coming from the diffusion, and this is coming from the nonlinearity. And now I need to estimate that. I will basically try to do some manipulation as much as I do with the nonlinearity, and if I don't succeed, I will have to use brutal estimates. Brutal, basically, you estimate these terms by using Hölder inequality. And indeed, I have three multiplication of three terms. So if I go into this term, I put in the first term the L6 norm, on the second term the L3 norm, and in the last term I put the L2 norm. One half plus one third, third plus one six is one. And therefore, I get here L6 gradient of an L3, etc. Now I use something called interpolation inequalities or calculus inequalities or Giliardo Nuremberg or Ladajanska, depending who's your hero. Okay? So then, then from this, you get that in three dimensions, the L3 norm under the right boundary conditions can be interpolated between one half L2 to the power half, a gradient of, of, of the function to the power one half. And now, if you have here gradient of in L3, I, I will replace this gradient, gradient, then gradient of a gradient, two derivatives is like Laplacian. Putting things together, therefore, this term here will be like L6 of u, gradient to the power 1 half, and Laplacian to the power 3 halves. And now, I don't like this product. I would like to 
make it into sum. So I use something called Young's inequality, and which is a times b less a to the power p, b to the power q, and one plus uh, one over p plus one over q equals to one. So I take this and I split it. Why I want to do that? Because I have a Laplace in here to the power three half. I would like to raise it to the power four over three to absorb it in the viscosity term here, which is, or the diffusion term here in the right hand side. And when I do that, I end up with, this is exactly using the Young's inequality, I end up with, this is the balance for the temperature. Yes? Just like before, your quality is in Yeah, 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 I mentioned three, yeah. yeah. I live in three dimensions. Just yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm a three-dimensional person. When I'm two-dimensional, I will let you know, I will go down like this. <laughs> Five dimensions, I don't have imaginations. <laughs> this is this is different workshop next door about topology. Rep that's where representation theory is about. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So different workshop. But uh, we're three-dimensional and we have time. We have to handle time too. So that's four already. Okay, so so yes, you're right. In three dimensions, and uh, and uh, and uh, so let's just continue. Please uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. And, uh, and our comments, because it's important to clarify these things. So thanks a lot, Sylvie. Uh, all right, so when I do that, then you get basically this is the balance for the grid of the temperature. And now I say, okay, this term is no longer, I don't need this term, the Laplacian anymore. I have the time derivative, I have the same quantity, and here is a factor. So you multiply by the integrating factor, which is e to the integral of this term of u, which people call it Gromwell inequality. It's basically like in multiplying by the integrating factor. And then from here, you conclude that the grid of the temperature is the original gradient e to the power of this integral. I went through this exercise slowly with all the details because eventually, in most problems in fluid mechanics, you have to repeat the same exercise again and again and again. And you have used Hölder that, Hölder this, maybe sometimes if you are fancy, use some harmonic analysis inequalities, or in best of spaces, use the para product, Bernstein, whatever. But eventually, that's what we do. You try to squeeze as much juice from the nonlinearity at first level, namely in the case of the temperature, the gradient at the maximum is zero, so the nonlinearity disappears. It doesn't bother me at the first level. And then when I go for the next level, it's as if I'm doing induction or bootstrap. I have to face the fact that I have nonlinearity. You have to face the monster or the beast. And then you go basically with your strongest uh, hammer and try to smash it. And therefore, you do estimates and so on and so forth. Now, have I done that? I face reality that, OK, this is all beautiful. But who tells me that this exponent is finite? So meanwhile, in order to show that the temperature is bounded, I had no problem. But now in order to show that the grid of the temperature under control, I need to deal with the transport part, namely with the velocity field. And therefore, the question becoming, is this quantity finite? And this is the question. Is the integral of the L6 norm of the velocity field to the power 4 is finite, which means that I have to go and deal with the fluid part, not the diffusion part only. I need to deal with the velocity vector field. Namely, I need to deal with the Navier-Stokes equations. And this is becoming the question. So the question, to answer this one, has to deal with the Navier-Stokes equations. So this is the Navier-Stokes equation. Usually, mathematical physicists and mathematicians replace here the right-hand side by f to disconnect from the rest of the world. But yet, I would like to have some excitement. So I put force. In my original model, it was the temperature here in the right-hand side coupled. But now you turn it off. Suppose somebody is exciting the fluid all the time, somehow, given force. Can you say something about these equations? Now, again, I would like to see what happens to the, to the gradient, uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the velocity field in L6. So one can really multiply, repeat the same story, multiply by u and integrate over the domain and use the fact that the nonlinearity is because of the incompressibility disappears, one can show really that the kinetic energy 
of the velocity field satisfying estimates of this type. You multiply, you integrate by parts, the linearity disappear, and use again Cauchy-Schwarz. Nothing really fancy about it, just Cauchy-Schwarz, and this is the Cauchy-Schwarz, and then you use again Young's inequality, and you get this is the balance for the energy. Now, when you do this is the balance of the energy, again, you use sort of Gromwell inequality, if you like, and one can show the following, that the L2 norm of the velocity is bounded, because if I take this term here and, and replace it by, 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 by the L2 norm by Poincaré inequality, or even if you don't want, you integrate this directly, you can show that the energy remains under control, namely the energy or the L2 norm of the velocity no matter which time you are, it is always bounded. And this is natural in some sense that you don't have infinite energy suddenly in the system. Because to do that, you have to, to have input infinite energy from the outside. So the L infinity norm for all the time is finite. But if you come to this equation and average it or integrate it in time, so therefore you get that the average of this quantity which is responsible for dissipating energy, this is the viscous term, this is the internal friction in the fluid, is also under control in the average. So this plus this, namely the solution is, and now maybe I start using the board, this is the advantage of doing things in person. What we have shown is, or what one can show in some sense that I will write here that you, that the solution in L infinity in the interval zero time with values in the space L2 is finite. And the solution L2 in time with values in the sublimit space H1 is also finite. That's basically what we have proved. The H1 because it's the gradient, it's the derivative. So, but this norm and these norms do not talk to each other, they are different norms. But what can we squeeze from this information? In fact, this was sufficient in order for Leray already in the 30s to make sense of the equation and to basically show that the Navier-Stokes equation has what's so-called weak solution or a solution in the sense of distributions, but 32, there was no sense of distribution, okay? So this is before the sense of distribution, where he basically makes sense of the equation, and he proved existence of weak solutions globally for any t you want, but the question of uniqueness of such weak solution remains open until today, especially if you would like to talk about solution in which you make sense of the dissipation of energy. Namely, that the L2 norm of the gradient is finite, okay? Because this is part of the physics, because you put energy to the system where it goes. It has to be dissipated by the viscosity. So, this is the situation since 1930s, early 30s, and this is how it is until today. There's a lot of attempt, there's different proofs, different arguments, but still we have global existence of weak solutions, and we don't know yet about uh, about the uniqueness of, 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 of weak okay? Now, what happens if we would like to talk about stronger solutions, namely that the initial data is smoother? Can I talk about something nicer? Well, so I would like to look what happens to the gradient of the velocity. Now, because it's incompressibility, the view equal to zero, the gradient, the L2 norm of the gradient is the same like the L2 norm of the curl. So this Quantity has a physical meaning, it's called the entropy. So I would like to talk about solutions which are continuous in time with the Sobolev space H1, or L2 in time with the L2 in time in the space H2. This is much stronger here. It is continuous with H1, L2 with H2, so it's much stronger. Can we make sense of solutions of this equation? Now to understand that, in order to, to control the H1 norm at every moment and moment, I need to control the gradient of u. Remember, to control the gradient of t, I was in trouble. Because it's transported by the velocity. Now, I want to control the gradient of u transported by u. So, most likely, I will run into similar kind of difficulties. And indeed, this is basically the situation. So in three dimensions, one can show global existence of weak solutions 
Short time existence of strong solutions, uniqueness of strong solution, and the operant problem is uniqueness of what's so called Le Rehoff weak solutions, namely the one which dissipate energy and global existence of strong solutions. So the same problem, and I will repeat that, that I had for controlling the gradient of the temperature. I need you to be in L6, and I don't know how to do that because I'm transporting gradient of you by you, and therefore I have the same sort of trouble. So let me repeat here the issue of regularity of Navier-Stokes, or for the gradient of the temperature, is exactly is the L6 norm remain under control? And I don't know how to show that. However, for short time, one can show that, and therefore you have only short time solutions. And the same for the temperature, the gradients for short time under control. Beyond that, we don't know how to do that. Okay? So, let me repeat something which is, I would say, maybe you would like to leave here with some message. If you have an equation of this type and in 3D, so just to suppose I have an equation of this type, d phi minus Laplacian phi plus u dot grad phi equals to zero. And I would like to control the, the gradient of phi somehow in three dimensions to be able to do that I need something of this type about the velocity. To control the gradient of phi. Transport plus diffusion. Now what if I don't have diffusion? And I would like to show nice existence, uniqueness, etc., etc. Of course, there is all kind because it's a linear equation. There are all kind of uh, weak formulation, the Bernal Lyons, and there is the, 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 the Italian school, etc. But if I am very naive, and I would like to solve this equation using the characteristic method, namely because this is a transport and the velocity is given, so I look to the the x dt equals to u, and now if I have two, here's x0 and x1 initial data, I have one characteristic, another characteristics, so because psi is transported along characteristics, in order not to have a shock or to have a problem, I need the characteristic never to meet. And in order for two characteristics never to meet, this ODE has to have existence and uniqueness, and we know from some classical theory of ODEs, that U has to be sort of Lipschitz or quasi-Lipschitz or something like that. And therefore, we need to control the gradient of U somehow in L infinity. And this is again the first place to put our foot on, our feet on, if you would like to go for something higher. So with diffusion, I need something like this. But without diffusion, I need maybe something like this or maybe other conditions of the same type. Just basically distinguishing between Diffusion and no diffusion. And of course, after you establish this result, you can really squeeze more and try to use your strong tools. This is very simple, classical background about what's happening here. Why I want to emphasize gradient U in L infinity? Because for Navier-Stokes, I have diffusion or viscosity. I have this condition. For Euler, I don't have viscosity. I will need conditions of this type, gradient of U in L infinity, all right? If this is under control, you have existence for 3D Euler. Of course, gradient of U in L infinity is like derivative. People can say, oh, what about instead of gradient of U, I talk about the curl of U. It's almost the same, but it's not because it's divergence U equals to zero. Maybe there is some relationship. This is the vorticity, and this is a tensor. The curl of U is the anti-symmetric part of the gradient of U, because it's centered, the matrix. And this is the anti-symmetric part of that. And the question, if this is under control, do I have global existence and uniqueness for Euler? And the answer is yes, and this is the celebrated bill katomida result. But this is trivial because of this. The Bill Katomida result is to translate, instead of doing that, to move into here using 
singular integral issues, and we know for singular integrals in harmonic analysis, L infinity is untouchable. Okay, there's a problem. The singular integrals are bounded operators from LP to LP, but exclude one and exclude infinity. Don't touch these things. But then when you have here L infinity, that's where they have to face the monster and therefore extract information and show that if you control this term, then you have existence for the, for the Euler equation. And you don't need to control it every moment and moment. Look to this condition, it's integral. And the same is here. You don't need that. You need the integral of this to be under control. This is the classical background about Navier-Stokes and Euler to show existence, uniqueness, and so on and so forth for classical solutions. I went through a big jungle very quickly and gave you what's the, what are the key players. I will summarize it very quickly. The question is, what's so special about L6? I just use in Hölder inequality, 1 6 plus 1 third plus 1 half equals to 1. But there is all kind of combinations. Why 1 6 plus 1 third? I can do other combinations. And indeed, there is something, some, it's called sometimes the, the, the uh, like prodiserin, and then sometimes called Lajanska prodiserin, some people call it Lajanska prodiserin. I don't want to get into the thing, so let's give credit for everybody. So it says if u is in LP in time with LQ in space, 2 over P plus 3 over Q equals to 1, then this is sufficient to show that the solutions exist and unique or strong solution globally exists. So if something goes wrong, is this norm, or any of those norms, it's actually if and only if. Incidentally, this was easy to prove for P, uh, for, uh, for, 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 uh, for uh, P and Q, which is excluding uh, one and, and, and three, but then when Q equals to three and P equals to infinity, this was settled later by, uh, by, uh, by Escorazia, Siriagin, and Shvirak. Yes? No, 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 one of them. Because if one of them, then all of them. Okay, you need one pair of PNQ. Yes, yes, one. yeah. Okay. If one of them goes to infinity, all of them go to infinity. And if one of them is finite, all of them finite. It's if and only if. Okay. Between an equal, that's what I said, the case of infinity and three, this is, has been settled. Uh, basically by this uh, group, and uh, so P equals to infinity, Q equals to 3. It was like settled, I don't know, maybe 10, 15, 12 years ago, maybe something like that. Okay, so now, after I mentioned what happens with the velocity field with estimates, fluid does not know calculus. Okay, fluid does not know calculus, and therefore calculus inequality doesn't know neither Gigliardo nor Nuremberg. Fluid is fluid. What really happens? Why we have issues? And in particular, why in two dimensions everything's fine, but three dimensions we have issues, okay? So one way to understand it is to move into the Vorticity formulation, which is favorite by engineers and by physicists somehow, yet there have issues with that, and I will tell you in a minute. Okay, so if we take the curve of the equation, this is the equation of motion for the Vorticity. And now I would like to emphasize this particular term, omega dot grad u, which is the vorticity stretching term. Now in two dimensions, this is identically zero. Why? Because the curl is in the z direction, while the nabla is in the xy plane, so the dot product is zero, so this term is not there. And as a result, in two dimensions, I have d omega dt, Laplacian of omega, u dot grad omega, and there is some forcing. Ignore the forcing for a second. Ah, this equation should remind you of the temperature, just transport and diffusion. And I know without much problem, I can show that maximum principle, namely omega is in L infinity. If omega is in L infinity bounded, and I'm in bounded domain, therefore omega in L2, namely the gradient of u is a square integrable. And this is the quantity I wanted to control in Navier stocks. So therefore, in two dimensions, I have no problem to show global existence. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the proof in one page why in two dimensions I have global existence. That's why. Because I can control the vortices.
In three dimensions, I have to deal with this term, which is called the vorticity stretching term. Why it's called vorticity stretching? Because look, this is the evolution of the omega, this is the transport of omega, and this is omega gradient of u, but gradient of u is like omega, so it's omega with omega. It's some kind of like you stretching omega by something related to omega, by the full tensor of omega, of u. And now this is, could be constructive or could be destructive. It could really enhance omega or it could basically deplete omega. And we don't know the sign of this term. But if you would like to take, take a treat, treat it like a brutally, it is, you call it stretching because maybe it's enhancing omega, but this is becoming an avalanche, like snowball, because omega is multiplied by itself, and therefore the larger the omega, the larger the rate of growth, and, and so on and so forth, and maybe this could lead into singularity. And that's why some people think that this is the the troublemaker, so if this is the omega that grad u is different than zero, and you think about omega is like z, I'm using hand wave argument, the engineering hat, as I said, so omega dot omega is like z square, and therefore the evolution is like z dot z square, which is a Riccati type of equation which blows up in finite time. This is the worst scenario. The other scenario is you don't have really z squared. Sometimes it's like z squared. Other times it changes in direction. It is basically smaller, and so on and so forth. And that's why in 3D, we still do not know how to prove global existence because of this term, the vorticity stretching term. OK? Now let me tell you something about vorticity stretching term. So let me go into this equation. What is the issue with this, uh, with this equation? I mean, there are two different textbooks in mathematics of the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay? Those who deal with vorticity and those who do not deal with vorticity. This is at least superficially. When you look into it, it says, why? Well, this guy likes vorticity, the other does not like vorticity. Now, if you would like to roll your sleeve and start dealing with it, what distinguishes the different textbooks dealing with vorticity and dealing with the velocity is what kind of domain and boundary conditions you are talking about. If you're talking about Navier-Stokes with physical domain, with physical boundaries, it is much more convenient to deal with the velocity vector field. And then you have to introduce all kind of like spaces and the ray projection and so on and so forth. But if you don't have physical boundaries, so either you are periodic boundary condition, as I was mentioning some yesterday. You know, what's in periodic boundary condition? You put your hand from this wall, because in this book, in this room, then it's basically you can scratch your back, because it's periodic, OK? So, so if you have no physical boundary, periodic boundary condition, then many people is much easier to deal with the vorticity. The other scenario where you don't have physical boundaries, when you are in the whole space. And that's why, I mean, when you read a paper about Navier-Stokes and he says, oh, these guys talk about vorticity, these guys talk about velocity. Why this? Why not that? It just look into the boundary conditions and into the physical problem in which domain they are treating it. Different tools are developed for different kind of like, uh, okay? Now, why you don't want to deal with the vorticity in bounded domain? I want. But I'm in trouble, because if you give me Navier-Stokes in bounded domain and say with Dirichlet boundary condition, if you give me Navier-Stokes equation in bounded domain, with Dirichlet boundary condition at the boundary, this is God-given, that's it. Now, I solve Navier-Stokes. And after I find the solution, I have to solve nonlinear equation. Then I find u inside the domain. Then I take the curl of u, and then I restrict it to the boundary. I need boundary condition for omega. When I have Laplacian of omega, whenever you see Laplacian, you need boundary condition. So where I'm going to get the boundary condition for omega? So I have to solve the problem first and doing it. And therefore, this is, will lead to some kind of like 
operators, which is Neumann Dirichle, and they are non-local and very complicated. And that's why uh, there are some issues when you have boundaries. And people who work with water waves know this issue very well because that's how you get some of the dynamics on the, on the surface of the waterways because it's a boundary, if it was a free boundary, therefore the boundary is moving, but then you need to do something along this line. To summarize, <laughs> there are two different textbooks with boundary or without boundary. With boundaries, then you deal usually with the velocity vector field. Without boundaries, then usually it's easy to do with the vorticity because it's very nice formulation and so on and so forth. Okay? And then you can do Fourier transform or Fourier series and beautiful theorems and, and so on and so forth. Okay? So it's not just because these people prefer that or prefer these. Sometimes there is a hidden assumption which is not written explicitly that I'm avoiding the boundary. All right? So again, it's still background material, but nonetheless, I wanted to tell you to be, to be alert. Now, there is something else, for example. I mean, for those of you, of you who are really even more intimate with fluids and read papers by engineers or by people who do, do physics, and go to journal of fluid mechanics and read. Then they are also, when they do some showing some experiment, again, there are two communities. Those who work in the pipe and those who work on the channel. Why? Is it because you like to be flat and the other one like to be rounded? No. If you work in the laboratory, you put the fluid in a pipe and you push it and you do experiments in the lab. But now doing computations in a pipe, you have to take the geometry to the pipe and which eigenfunctions you use and which discretization, too complicated. Flat boundary, very easy. I can do chippy shift in this direction, periodic, put it in the computer, life is easy, and I put it in the computer and I'm done. Two communities. This is make life easy and this is make life easy. And trust to go, I mean, doing experiments in channel, people do it. But it's not easy, especially if you want to go for high Reynolds number. All right? So don't be too naive. I mean, people do things because that's what they can do. But nonetheless, you have to understand why it is done here and why it's done there. OK? Very good. We finish with this. We move, move into Euler. So when, I've, when I don't have viscosity, so the first person working on the, on the Euler equation was even before Le Ray, why it was Liechtenstein 1925. He proved the following result, that for a short time, if the initial data is in the, sub, in, the, in the Hölder space C1 alpha, classical space C1 alpha, you have short time existence and uniqueness of, of, of the Euler equation. Then Ebbin Marsden and then Kato Online, Tima, many, many other people proved the same result, but instead of talking about the space C1 alpha, they spoke about the space, sober space HS for S bigger than 5 over 2. And for those among you who are basically know a little bit about Sobolev embedding theorem, they know there is an intimate relation, sort of maybe, between HS and C1 alpha. In particular, HS for bigger than 5 over 2, it is embedded in the C1 alpha. So this is using classical tools, classical theory, and this is using somehow modern tools, namely about Hilbert spaces and so on and so forth. But it's the same result in the assets. Okay? Does there exist a global weak solution for 3D Euler? Le Ray already, when he treated Navier-Stokes, he basically did buy one, get one free. He did weak solution and strong solution at the same time. But trying to show something about weak solutions for Euler equation, it was a challenging problem for many, many, many years. OK? And the question is, uh, the answer is yes, this was part of the thesis of Widman, but it is not really Widman who invented the techniques. It's the techniques of convex integration, which was introduced by different communities, and I will try to, to go very quickly over that. But Delelis and Sikahidi were the people who introduced us to, to the analysis community, and then it became now powerful machinery in which one can show existence of weak solutions for 3D Euler. 
Navier stocks, we know there exist global weak solution. Whether there exists a unique global weak solution of Lerehoff type, namely that they dissipate energy, we still do not know. Maybe we are on the process of solving it, we, I mean the community, not I, okay? But in the earlier case, when you talk about weak solutions, until like 2011, we didn't know if there exist one, but as they say, when it rains, it pours. 2011, not only it proved there exists one, they show there is infinitely money, okay? Now, the thing about this particular construction, and I will talk about that, it is really kosher, namely it satisfies the equation in the sense of distribution. However, some of these solutions might not be physical, and this is part of the discussion about what we will talk about in NM. In, 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 in. All right, so this is the Bill Katomada that I mentioned to you earlier, that you need to control the L infinity in order to show existence and uniqueness of or a global solution of strong solution. And one, therefore, one has to control the L infinity. And I mentioned that earlier. I'm just basically summarizing what happened. Now, weak solutions for 3D Euler, as I said, the existence of family and non-uniqueness of weak solutions of the Cauchy problem of 3D Euler has been recently, recently like 2011 by Whitman. This was part of his thesis, but it was based on the Convex integration machinery, which was uh, introduced by Delelis and Sikahidi, showed the existence of non-trivial family of weak solutions of 3D Euler equations, which are compact support in space and time. So let me try to translate this uh, sentence into plain words, okay? Compact support in space and time. You go to sleep at, at time, at night, you take a glass of water, so therefore the water is compactly supported, it's confined in some glass. I mean, imagine, okay? You put it next to you, the water is still zero. This means the solution is zero outside, it's zero everywhere. And then in the middle of the night, the water in the glass starts moving on its own. So the solution becoming non-trivial in time, but still confined in the glass. So it's compactly supported in space. You think there is ghost in the room, therefore you get scared and you go to sleep. When you wake up in the morning, the water is still still, zero, not moving. That means it's compact support in time. In the past it was zero, in the future zero, and in between it moved. This is the kind of solution they constructed. I mean, this is certainly not physical, but yet it solves the equation in sense of distribution. I mean, you create motion from nothing, basically you create energy from nothing. And this is, all right? Yet, it is mathematically correct, which is basically tells us that we need, in addition, when I give you the Euler equation, instead of show existence of solution, I would like to give you some more information to tell me what kind of solution which are, what are the extra properties of the solution I need, which is really to make it physical. Like solution which is create energy on its own should be ruled out. All right, so this is part of the issues about the, the, the equation. So the present proof of this result is really what's make it really interesting for us in our community that's not traditional PDE. And what do I mean by traditional PDE? Usually if I give you a partial differential equation and ask you to prove existence and uniqueness, what do you do? You take the equation, you somehow approximate it, discretize it by time or by space, or approximate it by convolution, or approximate the initial data, and then show that the approximate equation has a solution, and then you have a priori estimate, everything is bounded uniformly, independent of the approximation. Then you use some compactness theorem, says, oh, there's a subsequence converging, voila, and I got, this is the procedure. This is what I call traditional PDE. This is coming completely from different world. The construction is not by this methodology, and it's more inspired from differential geometry by something which is called, say, share some ideas, of uh, the, 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 the Nash-Kuiper uh, 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 theorem for invariant embedding of surfaces. And I don't want to talk about that. That's not really my, perp my, my the, the topic because I want to talk about geophysics. Otherwise, these guys would kill me, all right? But nonetheless, I thought it's important to put things in perspective because otherwise uh, we, will not, we will not be able to connect to the, geo to the geophysics. So this 
Examples has been earlier been given by Schneerman and Schaeffer, much earlier than this, but the construction here is completely different than the construction there. And the construction a la Deleuze and Sekehidi gave us more inspiration to extend it to other equations and to see what is going on there. But yet, either physical or not, we still do not know. So now, as I said, many of these solutions might not be physical. So I suggest the following ruling out uh, of solutions. So, so the work of Deleuze and Sekehidi implies that there are non-uniqueness of weak solution, especially with the initial data equals to zero. So how could that, that happen? So I need to get some ruling out the question. So a ruling out mechanism. Again, I'm not ambitious. I'm sorry. All right? People usually say, give me a selection criteria. I want uniqueness. Which one should be the unique solution? I says, look, I'm not telling you which one will be the good guy. I'm going to tell you who are the bad guys, whom you can rule out, which one non-physical. Why? Because I start believing, and I'm not obsessed with this issue of uniqueness. This issue of uniqueness is an obsession which has been introduced to us long time ago. I mean, of course, it's a nice idea for many systems, deterministic system, but maybe nature did not to follow one particular path. And the issue of uniqueness is something we should really re-understand re and reinvestigate. Of course, we like uniqueness, and physicists like this deterministic because you can always, when you do experiment, you have uniqueness, and you make error at the beginning. You would like to see what's the error later. So this is part of experimental error and experimental numerical analysis. I converge, etc. Whether nature is obeying particular solution or not, it is something which is we should really ha have more open-minded about it. And maybe we should start saying, well, I should not really talk about individual solutions, but maybe cluster of solutions, ensemble of solutions. Each one of them could be many, many solutions, but then they have some distributions. And therefore, if I start with initial distribution of solutions, and each of them will be bifurcate and become many, many solutions. How this probability is evolving, this is, I believe, the point of view that probably, most likely, what governs some models in nature. I still do not know how to address it. There are some people working on that. There are some classical work also on that. But my point is this obsession with uniqueness, we should really maybe not to be too tight into it. And that's why, basically, I would like to rule out non-physical solutions. I'm not telling you which solution is the physical one, and therefore I should choose it. So the question, can we rule out such of these solutions? And let me, before I go into the ruling out uh, mechanism, let me talk about 2D Navier-Stokes and Euler equation. So as I said, in two dimensions, we have global existence and uniqueness. And in every textbook, you have global existence and uniqueness. 3D Navier-Stokes, we have global existence of weak solutions. I don't know uniqueness. But I have short-term existence and uniqueness of strong solutions in 3D. And now, here is the question. What is two-dimensional Navier-Stokes equation for many people? If you take any textbook, it says, assume that the velocity field u is function of x, y initially, and then it remains function of x, y. Excuse me, why should it remain function of x, y? Why the weak solution cannot suddenly decide, I want to depend on z tomorrow? I don't have uniqueness. I can have any scenario. So. For decades, the whole community overlooked that point and assumed an ansatz that when you talk about 2D Navier Stokes equation, I'm assuming that the solution start function of two variables, remain function of two variables. And the same with all symmetry, axis symmetric, helical symmetrics, it's an ansatz that you start like that and you remain like that. But in view of this convex integration machinery, all scenarios are open. And now, here is the result with uh, Bardos, uh, Lopez, uh, New, and, uh, and Nussens Feig, which states the following. Let u0 be a function of x, y. 
Then the Lerayhoff weak solution of 3D Navier Stokes remain function of XY alone. Ooh, we are saved by the bell. Weak solutions in general need not to remain function of XY, but the one which dissipates energy, the Lerayhoff, is the only solution and remains function of XY. Therefore, this ansatz in 2D Navier Stokes equation about weak solutions within the class of solutions of the 3D Navier Stokes equation is the one. Maybe there are other solutions which has become function of XY and Z, even though they start function of XY. Now, of course, similar results hold for Navier Stokes equation axis symmetric and with helicity. So, therefore, we are saved that all the work about Navier-Stokes 2D and symmetry in which you put the ansatz that remain XY, in fact, these are the only solutions which dissipate energy, namely the Lerayhoff weak solution. Now, if U0 is function of XY and weak solution of 3D, Euler, Euler, then the solution might become function of XY and Z by the convex integration machinery. But if I talk about Lerayhoff, it does not. Why I'm saying that? Because it's natural. If you start function of x, y, why suddenly you become x, y, and z? You need some kind of like randomness, some kind of perturbation, some kind of like noise, whatever, to kick you out from this kind of like situation. So for Euler, this is, can be happening. In other words, I would like to use this theorem as a leading or as, as, as a guide for selection mechanism or for ruling out mechanism. Well. If I start with Navier-Stokes equation, initial data zero, the only solution of Navier-Stokes, weak or strong, is the zero solution. So therefore, if I need to solve Euler, I need to add viscosity to it and see what happens to the limit as viscosity goes to zero. So my ruling out Criterion is the following. Any solution of Euler, weak solution, which cannot be achieved as a limit of a subsequence of a subsequence of a subsequence or whatever, should be ruled out. If it's not really a limit of Le Ray Hopf weak solution, should be ruled out. For example, all these solutions here which suddenly become function of XYZ will be ruled out because the minute I put viscosity, if you start XY, you remain XY. And if I start with initial data zero and I put viscosity, then the only solution is zero. When I let viscosity go to zero, the only limit is zero. So all these kind of like what I what's called like, you know, nightmare solutions, namely the one which is the water moves on its own, will be ruled out. Now, still maybe there are, because we don't know about uniqueness of Larry Hopf. Maybe we don't have uniqueness of Larry Hopf. Okay? So uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe uh, still one can show non-uniqueness of Larry Hope, but that's fine. But then I take subsequences converging, and maybe I have non-uniqueness for the Euler. Okay, so this is the ruling out. A weak solution of Euler, which is, cannot be achieved as limit of Navier-Stokes as viscosity 10 to 0, should be ruled out. That's the, now I'm talking about without boundaries, huh? This is mathematical thing without boundaries, because if I have physical boundaries, even in two dimensions, we still do not know if Navier-Stokes converge to Euler because of boundary layers and so on and so forth. I don't want to talk about that. That's not part of the, what I'm going to talk about here. Okay, so I'm talking about without boundaries. So I'm disconnecting boundary effect. All right, moving into geophysics. We're living on a rotating Earth. Because we live in rotating Earth, let me consider Euler equation with rotation. This is Coriolis. The very first equations that I mentioned earlier, I had the Coriolis force. And now what happens with the Euler equation? I, showed, I told you Liechtenstein proved existence and uniqueness for short time of solution. Now then we have now weak solutions. You have infinitely many, but maybe many of them are physical, not physical. This is yet to be determined. And now what happens if you have rotation? Now, let me mention, because I have been so much selling you Sobolev spaces and Hilbert spaces, multiply, integrate by parts, etc. 
Coriolis, the way it is written here, is anti-symmetric. So every time you multiply by U and integrate, it gives me zero. It does not contribute to the energy estimate. If I take derivative and then multiply by the derivative and integrate, it gives me zero. So it does not contribute directly to the Sobolev norms. And that's why for a long time, the community said, with or without Coriolis, I'm facing the same problem. But this is too naive. This is not taking the structure of the equation into consideration. And the first work in that sense, looking to what happens to the limit equation as omega goes to infinity was a work by Embed and Maida, which is basically derived the equation when omega equals to infinity, the formal limit. And it was investigated and showed that the equation you get as omega goes to infinity as a, as, 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 as a, is basically like 2D Euler coupled with something. And therefore says the limit equation is much better behaving than the 3D Euler. And therefore, maybe one can show something about the equation when omega is large. So Babi Mahalov and Nikolayenko studied this equation with fast rotation. And what they have shown is the following result. If you give me time and initial data, you give me initial data and time, and if I would like the solution to survive up to time t. By the way, this is not the way we formulate problems in PDEs, but let's go with their scenario, with their narrative. You want this, the, the, the climate not to become singular in up to time t. So if you rotate Earth fast enough, I can guarantee you that the singularity would not occur before time t. That's the result that they say. So in other words, you know, I don't know how many of you saw the old movie of Superman who can spin Earth, all right? So if you would like to stabilize the climate, you call Superman and ask him to, force, to rotate Earth very fast. Maybe we'll go somewhere else, but that's a different story. So this is how they stabilize the climate, or that's how they stabilize the solution, by fast rotation. That's basically the result. All right. Now, of course, they did it in periodic boundary condition. There is some uh, other other work by 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 uh, by uh, by Shema, De Jordan, Delarguer, Grenier. There is a book even about it in the whole space. This is in periodic boundary condition. There is some work by Masmoudi, by Zayan, and there is some work by Liu and Tadmor about the Euler about the Burgers equation. And I'm going to talk about that. Now, in the next few minutes, I'm going to show you why. Why rotation is a stabilizing mechanism, all right? Because nobody has shown to us that uh, Euler has singularity or regularity. What if Euler has a global existence? Then I don't need the rotation. The people here prove that if you rotate fast, for sure you don't have singularity. But if I don't have singularity originally, so rotation does not hurt me or does not help me. The question becoming now for me, is this really an artifact of their proof or their really real mechanism that rotation stabilizes? So to understand that, I need to take an illustrative example. I don't know many equations, let's say simple equations, which I know they develop singularity in finite time. One of these equations that every one of you saw in their undergraduate courses or graduate courses is the inviscid burgers. It develops shocks in finite time. So for sure, this equation has singularity. All right? So now I'd like to add rotation and show you that rotation will prevent singularity. Rotation, one-dimensional problem. How can I rotate? It's one-dimensional problem. Well, you have to use your imagination, OK? What do you mean you have to use your imagination? So before I go to use my imagination, as I said, if you give me initial data, which is some place is monotonic decreasing, then you develop shock. So the solution given implicitly by this formula, and you know that basically for short time you have existence and uniqueness, but eventually you develop a shock. So I would like to see the effect of rotation and to its one dimensional problem. So you need to use your imagination. What do you mean you use imagination? You have to introduce imaginary numbers. That's what you use your imagination, OK? So therefore, let me think about you being complex. And z, instead of being x, also being complex. And now I look at the complex Burgers equation, u sub t plus u, u, z. Forget about the i omega at the moment. 
So this is the complex Burger's equation. When u is a complex analytic function with respect to z, and the derivative with respect to z is complex analytic. Now, without the i omega, for sure it's the same story. You give me initial data which is analytic in some strip around the real axis, I can show you in finite time there is a singularity for complex analytic Burger's equation. And now I need to add rotation, and we know to add rotation is in complex number is like adding the number i omega u. Because if you look to the, o, the ODE w dot, if I look at this ODE, W dot equals I omega W, the solution W of T is e to the I omega T, W of zero, which is e to I omega, is just changing the argument, it's rotation. As I take the complex number and rotate it. Now what happens in this equation? So if I do the change of variables, V equals e to the I omega U, the integrating factor, then V is satisfying the following equation, Vt e to the e to the minus i omega V Vz. And now I use the characteristic but in the complex plane, and can show that V of Z is satisfying the initial V at this argument. And now what is the shock or what is the problem or singularity? It means that dV dz becomes infinite. But if I look for dV dz by the implicit differentiation, it's V0 prime at this argument, divided by 1 plus e to the minus i omega minus 1, blah, 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 at this argument. All right? And now the whole problem that we have singularity is the denominator becoming zero. That's when we have problem that we have singularity, when the denominator equals to zero. And now, if I look at this equation, at the denominator equal to zero, so I have initial data V0, which is analytic in some strip in the complex plane. And if I call M to be the supremum of V prime of zero in this, in, this, uh, in this plane. Now, if I take omega to an absolute value to be larger than 2M, then notice that this quantity here is maximum absolute value M. The numerator is maximum 2, and the numerator omega, so this ratio is 2m over omega. 2m over omega strictly less than 1 in absolute value. It could never be equal minus 1, and you can kiss singularity goodbye. So if the rotation omega large enough depending on initial value, there is no more singularity. So indeed, rotation is a stabilizing mechanism, all right? This is not really a surprise because, in fact, so this is the result that I mentioned. It's not because fast rotation is averaging. If I look to the integrated version of V, V is V0, e to the minus i omega V, V, z. V, V, z is the nonlinearity. Notice that if V is like million, V, V, Z is like million square. How could I balance million with million square? Ah, but I'm integrating from zero to T. So therefore, million square times little t, if t is small, million square times t can be million. And that's why you show short time existence. This is an engineering proof, huh? I can balance. For short time, I have existence because million squared times t, when t is a small, can be equal to million, cannot exceed. But now I'm claiming t is very, very large. Oh, I have oscillations, e to the i omega. And what do oscillations do? They do cancellation. In fact, there is something called the Riemann-Lebesgue lemma, which we teach for undergraduate, tells you that if you give me a function phi of t, sine kt, when k goes to infinity, this integral goes to zero. Any function when integrated against something very oscillatory, very oscillatory, it becoming small. So when omega large, it's very oscillatory, 
It makes the whole contribution small. It was million square, but because of the oscillation, it becomes small. It can balance million. And therefore, that's why we have global existence. So, in some sense, rotation is leading to averaging. While this example is very illustrative, because the rotation and the nonlinearity were out of resonance. And therefore, because there was out of resonance, I can see that the rotation leads to complete oscillations, which makes the nonlinearity small. If there were resonance term between nonlinearity and the rotation, then I will have some terms of order one, no contribution from oscillation, no cancellation because of that, because of resonance, and then I'll be in trouble. Now, this example that I mentioned here, this is exactly the outline, but for a simple example of what Bobby Mahalov and Nikolenko did, and other people did in their books, and so on and so forth, but this is the idea. Do you have resonance, or there is no resonance? And if there is resonance, how bad is the resonance set? Can you control the resonance set? And so on and so forth, okay? So, this uh, complex, uh, complex uh, uh, Burger's equation, if you think about it as, uh, if you look at u to be u1 plus i u2, because u is complex now, so u1 and u2 are the real and imaginary part of u, you can use Cauchy-Riemann equation, and therefore the complex equation can be written as a vector u, u is like u1 plus u2, it becomes exactly like the vectorial Burger's equation with rotation. So in some sense, the one that I mentioned to you, the complex Burger's, was not really far away from real world. It is, in some sense, the two-dimensional Burger's, but when u1 and u2 are the real part and imaginary part of complex analytic functions, and that's basically what, uh, what happens in this case. All right. Slowly, we're marching toward geophysics. I would like to mention this particular model because it was, uh, at least in some sense, in, in my career, it was, uh, or in some of my work, it was uh, a, a turning point. This equation is Binard convection in porous medium. So it is like Buzanisk equation, the first equation. But now imagine that you have a block of purest medium, which is say heated from the bottom and cooled from the top. So I have a porous medium here. And it's periodic in this direction and it is porous medium, so it has, and then I heat here and I cool here. It's the original problem that I have, so you have the temperature diffusion and transport, but now because of the porosity, the question what happens to the Navier-Stokes equation part, namely to the momentum part? Because of the porosity, there is something called Darcy law, which replaces the momentum equation between balance between the gradient of the pressure and the velocity field, and this is called Darcy law. So the first equation, so when gamma equals to zero, this is the classical Darcy law. So this is Darcy law, which is u times the gradient of p, and this is the buoyancy, as in my very first transparency. Divergence of u equal to zero, and this is the temperature equation. So this is the model, which is called the Binard convection, but in porous medium. Now, what's interesting about this equation, actually, Pierre Fabry, 1986, I think it was maybe part of his thesis, he proved global existence and uniqueness of this system in three dimensions. Okay? Now, let me show you why we have global existence for this model. Well, if you remember my first equation, I, I have the temperature here. The temperature satisfies maximum principle, so the temperature is in L infinity. I have shown you in about half an hour, about, like, like, about almost an hour ago, I have shown to you that to control the gradient of the velocity temperature, the gradient of the temperature, 
I need the velocity to be in L6. Remember that? And I said, that's the problem. OK, now let us look into this model. To control the gradient of t, I need u to be in L6. t is in L infinity, I'm in finite domain. So t for sure, t itself is in L6. Let me look into the first two equations. The relationship between the temperature and u is linear, almost proportional. And therefore, it is not difficult to show that if t is in L6, therefore u is in L6. And I rest my case. Because if u is in L6, I can show the gradient of the temperature under control. And now you can bootstrap. If the gradient of temperature is under control, you can really go ahead and finish the whole thing. So why this model is simpler than the original one? Because Darcy law kills the obstacle, the nonlinearity. The problem in the navier stokes u dot nabla u. Now I don't have it anymore. So that's why I gave this simple introduction earlier. Because I'm going to use this joker every time I can control u and L6 in any model, I rest my case. See why I went through that at the very beginning. And I'm now I'm going to finish the problem one after the other. I revealed to you the secret of how do I write papers. L6. L6. Okay. So, I mean, of course, this is over, overstating it, but you need to understand the heart of the matter. Once you touch the heart of the matter, you can play with it. If you can, of course. I mean, okay? So this is basically the idea, and this was very important paper for, for at least uh, in the, Of course, the, 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 the way I was working on that coming from different things, from nanian galerkin method, in which we proved that the solution of this equation are actually not only exist and unique. In fact, even in the physical boundary conditions, the solutions are analytic become analytic, and because analytic, then the Galerkin procedure converge exponentially fast with the spectral error and so on and so forth. That's how I became interested in this from numerical analysis point of view, not from PDE point of view, because Fabry settled the situation already in 1986. Okay? But I became interested in this from numerical analysis point of view, that if you do Galerkin procedure for this particular uh, model, you have exponential uh, error estimates. Nice. So now we go into large scales, and this is in some sense preparing for the lecture that uh, that uh, is going to be next by, by by Rupert. I'm going to talk about models where we are talking about like large scales, large horizontal scales, because I have the planet, I have the oceans, and so on and so forth. So you have all these kind of like big motion at horizontal scales, but then the ocean relatively to the size of the, of the Earth is very small, or the atmosphere is very thin, and therefore I am somehow like very thin but very wide. Can one take advantage of that in order to show something? And this is basically will be part of the lectures will be given by Rupert, in which telling you if you do the asymptotics, then you get certain models, and now the next thing says, oh, the limit model, you have an epsilon, when epsilon goes to zero, this is the formal limit model. Can you show something about it? So the limit may be better behaving than the original one. So maybe you show that the limit is beautiful, is nice. And now can you go now backwards and show that under the right conditions for deriving the formal Limit, can you justify it rigorously? Can you show the solution of the original model when epsilon different than zero is close to the solution when epsilon equals to zero? So let me tell you something, which is not a secret, but it's important. In real world, epsilon not zero. So don't fool yourself. Epsilon never zero in real world. Epsilon different than zero. We use epsilon equals to zero as an approximation for the real world. Go and justify it. And give me error estimates, how much I can really trust your results. Okay? So that's basically the underlying situation. We need to justify 
singular limits. So really we can use the singular limit equation as for, for numerics, for computations, because maybe it's easier to do. But then having in mind that it is reflecting or approximating reality, and I have in my pocket a credit card guarantees me how much I am far away from reality. So that's why we need theorems to show that the limit is well posed and that there is closeness between the epsilon small and the real limit. Without that, everything will be formal and that's fine. But then it is not really justifiable. Okay, so, so I'm going to talk about models which is, uh, which is derived by physicists or geophysicists. So these are like basically large circulations at large wide scales. In, in comparison to the, to the thickness of the atmosphere and the ocean. And if I go back into my very first transparency, the really binard convection or the Bosonis approximation, so I'm going to look into this kind of like equation, and I would like to take it in the context of the ocean. Okay, I'm going to steal some of the show of Professor Klein. So if I write, I mean, it's different. Uh, I mean, you should come to his lecture. But, no, but I'm just basically trying to prepare for, for the models that, that I will talk about. So if you look into the equation that I have, I put here everywhere H. You know, this H stands for horizontal. So I'm writing the momentum equation. The first is the horizontal component. The W is the vertical component of the of the, of the equation for the balance of momentum. This is the incompressibility and this is the temperature. So the velocity field decomposed into V horizontal and vertical. Now I'm going to take from real world and look into typical quantities, what's happening in the situation. So typical scales in the ocean, so horizontal distances is thousands of kilometers. The depth is, is the, the, the typical horizontal velocity 10 to the minus one meter per second. Typical depth of the ocean is orders of few kilometers. Uh, the frequency of the Coriolis force, like the Earth rotating one round every 24 hours. The gravitational uh, is acceleration 10 meter per second square approximately. The density of the water and so on and so forth. So this typical quantities in the ocean. And now, from this, I can calculate typical vertical velocity, which is W, which is the horizontal, multiplied by the aspect ratio of the depth versus the, the width. And again, I'm, not, uh, I'm, 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 I'm using this. So therefore, typical velocity vertical is 10 to the minus 4 meter per second. Typical pressure 10 to the power 7 pascal. And typical type scale in the and the ocean is 10 to the power 7 seconds. So these are typical quantities. Now why I do that? If I come here into the vertical balance of momentum, and I replace W by its typical value and the delta T or the time by its typical value W over T, and every term by term I take it and plug the numbers that I just gave to you, you will get something like order 10 to the minus 11, minus 11, minus 11, 10, and 10. And you can see that the first three terms in this equation for typical quantities are 12 orders of magnitude smaller than the last two quantities. So, you know, if you are a big banker and deal with billions, you're not going to come and bother about $1 there and $1 here. So therefore, geophysicists have no problem sleeping at night if they drop the first three terms. I says, why should I bother about change? All right? And therefore, this is leads to some balance. And this is what's so called hydrostatic balance. So in, in ocean dynamics, in some sense, people basically say that in the vertical momentum equation is the balance between the gradient of the pressure and the buoyancy. Of course, if you have like a temperature, and, 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 and this is the, the equation for the hydrostatic balance. Now, if you go into the case of horizontal momentum, again, when you plug these quantities, you get something like 10 to the minus 8, minus 8, minus 2, minus 5. It's not really exactly in balance. However, again, the first three terms are much smaller than the last ones. 
And therefore, you could say, well, you know, maybe I should drop these particular terms, the first three terms, and then keep the leading order terms, which is the last two terms. And if you do that, you're basically balancing the gradient of P with the Coriolis force. And this is called, so, uh, so you use something which is called, uh, all right, so you use something which is called the Rossby number, which is the ratio of the intensity of the nonlinear effects and the intensity of the Coriolis force. And now one can show that in these circumstances, the Rossby number is like almost 10 to the minus 3, which is a small. And for small Rossby number, the balance is called geostrophic balance, which is the gradient of the pressure is balanced by the Coriolis force. Notice that there is the hydrostatic balance, which is, you can see the gap between the scales is large. It's more clear. But if you go for the next order, which is less clear, then you have the geostrophic balance, which is at the horizontal. One is at the horizontal momentum, one is at the vertical momentum. And of course, nobody can prevent me from using both. On the other hand, the difference is not so clear, and that's basically part of the lectures, which is I went, don't want to talk to it. I mean, like basically, the expert here is going to tell us. But I'm going to take it face value. Somebody gave to me. These are the equations. So in ideal case, by ideal mean no viscosity, no friction. I live in beautiful world. Everybody is friendly. Everybody says good morning to everybody. No conflict, no friction. Okay. So an ideal world, in some sense. The first equation is the horizontal balance of momentum, which is the geostrophic balance. The second is the vertical balance of momentum, which is the hydrostatic balance. This is the incompressibility, and this is the temperature. And I'm interested in studying this equation. So, the equation is, I don't live in real world, which is like everything is beautiful and perfect. I have, I have conflict, I have friction, and therefore, how do I add friction? How do I add viscosity into this system? And that's why I put here F for friction in the horizontal direction, okay? F of V of F, and I have also diffusion for the, for the, for the temperature. So I have here diffusion and, and, and have that. So without the F and without the diffusion part, this is the model that I took it from simple, very uh, uh, beautiful balance. I say these terms are small, I drop them, and I have this set of equations. And now I need to add this uh, 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 friction or diffusion, uh, diffusion. So I have two options. This conventional eddy viscosity says that the friction term in the horizontal is sort of diffusive or viscous term. And for the temperature is also diffusive term. The other option is called linear drag, namely from friction with the bottom of the of the ocean or with the continental shelf. It's friction rather than eddy viscosity diffusion or viscosity dissipation. So I have two different mechanisms. I'm going to use the first and on the second, and we will see what will happen in this case. And in the other case, and I will continue with that tomorrow. But until tomorrow, don't forget, I have a very simple card at hand. And this simple card is basically, this is this simple card. This system, this will be my guidance. And L6. <laughs> okay, so I will have these two together to start going through the models and show you why it works here, why I have an issue there, and so on and so forth. Until tomorrow, I still have now five minutes. I will like to entertain some questions and if you have any discussion. Thank you. <laughs>